Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Feidel. This is our series called View from the North. And today we're going to compare Native American Indian issues uh, in the U.S. and Canada. What can we do to make life better for them? We certainly haven't done that necessarily over the past, especially in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. Uh, for this discussion, we have Dr. Ken Rogers, uh, who is a retired a Canadian businessman living in Kelowna, British Columbia. He can help us understand how the Indian tribes are doing in Canada, uh, and we can compare how they are doing with how American Indians are doing and have been doing, and what we, everyone, including the government, uh, can do to make life better for them, both north and south of the border. The very, very bleak uh, uh, position that Canada's Native people were in a few years ago has been improving very quickly and very dramatically. You know, for example, um, one of our medium-sized provinces, uh, Manitoba, that's right north of Minneapolis, um, <clears throat> it just recently elected a, uh, a Native Indian as its premier for the province. But um, our history was was very much like the U.S. Um, uh, we did not do the same level of of you know, the little bighorn slaughtering the Indians, much like the U.S. did. However, and we also didn't ship uh, in, uh, whole tribes to different locations, like the U.S. sent many uh, Indians to Oklahoma that were from nowhere near Oklahoma. However, uh, our initial approach to handling natives or dealing with them uh, for all of Canada was one of of trying to force them to assimilate. Uh, and the key piece of the enforcement was uh, what are called um, uh, Indian schools, or, you know, that they required every Indian child to go to a, uh, a separate school. Most of them were run by the Catholic Church, uh, and there's fantastic, uh, endless list of horror stories of what arose with these residential schools, as they were called. Well, the point of these schools was to, you know, eliminate any native language uh, usage, and secondly, uh, you know, to uh, try to have um, all of the kids uh, more assimilated to you know, the Canadian way of life. Um, uh, it was uh, a, a terrible failure, really. Um, you know, as late as, um, as 1970, we had the then Prime Minister of Canada, the father of our current Prime Minister, you know, then it was Pierre Trudeau, uh, and he uh, came, uh, developed a thesis that uh, we should end all agreements with all natives and they should just period assimilate, no other choice. Um, and he really pushed hard, uh, but there was such a backlash from the native population that, uh, that his government actually ended up backing down, but it shows that, you know, only, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, you know, there was that, um, that same attitude that created these residential schools. Well, uh, you know, in a, a few years ago, we had a, um, a governmental uh, commission or a special study of, and uh, <clears throat> really the, uh, it was called rec recreation. Or <laughs> sorry, um, the um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought on that. But anyhow, the uh, the entire study was was how do we do reconciliation with the native population? Well, what we're sitting with now, you know, is day and night different than you know forty fifty years ago. Is that the the 
kids that were forced to go through these residential schools, especially the latter part of them, which was the same time that I was in, you know, junior high school and high school, there was, you know, kids going through these residential schools. Well, as those um, uh, natives became older and they started to dominate their societies, uh, you know, they really had a um, almost like a motivation for revenge or motivation to fight back so that we had, you know, a, a the majority of the leaders in all of the native population in Canada were very, very anti everything that they had been uh, had shoved down their throat in these residential schools. And so this reconciliation with our natives has been very difficult. Now, compared to the US, um, we have about 5% of our population is native. Now we break our native uh, natives into three categories. We have, uh, you know, what Americans would call a normal Indian, uh, Métis, and uh, thirdly, we have Inuit. Now, the U.S. has Inuit in Alaska, you know, but, uh, you know, the Inuit were treated much better in many regards because nobody was there pushing them around. And uh, and our history dealing with the natives is, is atrocious at every turn. Um, you know, we had entered into treaties with the natives and then endlessly broke every treaty that was ever signed. You know, we provided the natives with reser reservations, you know, but then stood on our head to shrink them or to try to, you know, expropriate things that weren't in there. Well, today, you know, the difference is, is the natives are, are called First Nations. And in the city I live in, which is about 250,000 people, about um, 70,000 of those people live on native land. And and we have major shopping centers on the native land and they get, um, the native band gets uh, revenue similar to the owners of land in Hawaii where it's like leased land. You know, under the Federal Indian Act, which governs all Indian reservations, um, you know, they cannot sell their land, uh, but but they can lease it. So I want to clarify one thing. When you say band, that's the same thing as tribe in the United States, right? Yes, somewhat. Uh, you know, we have these so-called First Nations. And, for example, in the area from, um, let's call it Central Washington State, um, north uh, to where I live, um, you know, there's um, uh, what was called one Indian nation in many regards uh, back in the old days has broken down into seven different, you know, smaller ones. And, and really in the Canadian part of that, uh, uh, you know, Columbia River Basin, uh, there the Okanagan River Basin, really, uh, <clears throat> they uh, there's five different First Nations, and they're pretty tiny in the sense of um, the one that owns all the land right near where I live, including, you know, where, you know, people like Walmart lease land from the natives, um, you know, and send money to their coffers. Well, that particular um, First Nation or band has less than a thousand people in it, like less than a thousand members. Now they have about um, about five square miles of land, uh, and most of it is, you know, surrounding one side of of the area, that, uh, the central part of British Columbia that I live in. And uh, and so that band, in theory, would be very wealthy. 
Well, in fact, it's it's a little bit like um, a typical oligarchy or like the breakdown of of income in the United States, as Bernie Sanders would describe. But, you know, the very rich are very rich and the top few hundred billionaires have more money than the bottom 30 percent of the U.S. population. Well, in a lot of these these Indian First Nations, um, as they became more economically integrated with the rest of Canadian society, you know, the the chiefs or the chief's friend or a few of the band members or tribe members, you know, managed to get the rights to deal with the, the land that's under the Walmart store or the land where, you know, there's a neighborhood with 10,000 single family homes sitting on it uh, and collecting rent. Uh, and so you have some multi multi millionaire uh, natives in the uh, metropolitan area where I live. And yet, if you go on to the reservation where it's, um, you know, not being rented to you know, some, uh, you know, Canadian business or Canadian neighborhood or, or a, you know, commercial store, you know, the poverty level is obviously um, much greater than the nearby neighborhoods. You know, that is the, the social problems still exist, not to the same degree as when I was, you know, a teenager, but for sure, uh, you know, it's a bloody disgrace. <laughs> uh, you know, Canada has made, uh, you know, the international news um, uh, as, you know, uh, not properly treating its indigenous people. Now, you know, it's easy for Germany or Austria or France to say that because they don't have any left. <laughs> you know, where they can pick on Australia and Canada and the U.S. and, you know, all the countries in South America. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, we do not have a nice history of dealing with our natives. Uh, however, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the plight of an American native in in the Dakotas is far worse than the plight of the natives, you know, a couple hundred miles north of there in Manitoba, where they just elected a native as the premier of the province. Now, our native population also has, um, you know, uniqueness in some of their crimes. Their, you know, the treatment of women is very uh, different in the handling in the Canadian natives the, the women are like third class citizens in their first nations in many regards now that's gradually changing we actually have some first nations where the the head of the first nation is a female for a change uh, but that is certainly happening much slower than in the rest of of uh, canadian society now uh, how does that compare with what's happening in the U.S.? Oh, oh, gee whiz. You know, the U.S. is inextricably intertwined with Indians, but we don't know it. Uh, we haven't been taught about that in school. Um, you know, since the 60s, um, we've been more conscious of it, but we're still not very conscious of it. Um, and, it's, you know, it is, it is racist. Uh, and it is completely unfair, um, and there's there's very little consciousness that brings it to equality. Let me go back in time, though. <clears throat> you know, we always uh, put down the Indians from the very beginning. Remember, the Indians were siding with um, the British and the French in the French and Indian Wars, and people didn't like that much. Um, and they saw they saw the Indians. The Americans uh, saw the Indians. The Americans were, you know, largely white Christian. They saw the Indians as as creatures and savages, and that lasted right through the 18th century, and through the 19th century, and even into the 20th century. 
And yes, uh, just as you say, there were all these treaties. You could you could list them. There'd be hundreds of them all over the country. Uh, with you know, uh, gosh, there must have been almost a hundred tribes in in the U.S. Um, and they got cheated on everything. They were taken advantage of in every way possible. Um, and then you know, you have the American public raised uh, with uh, Hollywood uh, in the twentieth century. Uh, you know, casting Indians as uh, as violent and brutal and, you know, subhuman um, for movie after movie after movie. And the, and the white Christian cowboy, he was the hero always. And so I think people carried that kind of racism forward into the 20th century. And even now we have these caricatures um, of Indians as less than white Christian Americans. We really got to get over that. Uh, to, some of your points are <clears throat> equally applicable to the US. We had those residential schools too, and they are famous for abuse and rape. Uh, the Catholic Church was involved in them. Um, horrible, br brutal atrocities took place in those schools, and state governments didn't stop it, and it went on for you know, a good part of the 19th century, uh, the 20th century. So, you know, what is really remarkable is how little the government cared about the human aspects of the Indian's condition. And of course, we had um, the Trail of Tears. And I want to tell you about the Trail of Tears. It wasn't just Georgia to Oklahoma. It wasn't just the Cherokees. It was a number of tribes a number of states, all in the South. And the government through Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren found ways to do horrible atrocities on them, marching them around under the, the these guides, these enforcers from the military that they had to travel West uh, to Oklahoma, to the Indian lands, they called it, which is now Oklahoma. And these were undesirable lands. They were junk lands. Uh, and and um, until they had of, oil, <laughs> well, we'll get to that. <laughs> they had a lot, you know, of deaths on the way. Um, now, not all of them moved. You know, some of them found ways not to move. And there are remnants of tribes in the southern states right now today, the Seminoles, for example, who actually rebelled. Um, but there wasn't all that much rebellion because the Howleys fooled them. Um, the Howleys made these phony treatments with them. Andrew Jackson was, he thought he was doing a good thing for the country, but he wasn't doing a good thing for the Indians. He thought he was enforcing longstanding policy vis-a-vis -vis the Indians, but he was actually destroying them. And this Trail of Tears, Ken, was genocide, no question about it. Their culture was wrecked, and they were killed, and they were exposed to uh, smallpox, among other things, and they died in huge percentages all over the country. And then, of course, we get to Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, a recent movie, right? And which tells you a story that you did not learn in school, but which is nevertheless absolutely true. <clears throat> These Howie guys married uh, the Indian women who had rights to oil. And uh, they resented the, the fact that the Indians had rights to oil because the Indians were supposed to go away into the worst lands imaginable back when in the 19th century. Instead, surprise, surprise, they have millions in oil revenue. <clears throat> but the, uh, the, the white Christian fellas married them and then killed them. In the movie, it makes it very clear and separated them and their families from ownership of the land. So they, the white Christian guys, um, could own the land and the oil. And this was a practice that was, you know, throughout Oklahoma and maybe other states where there was oil. That's what the movie is about. But why the movie is so popular is that it examines this racism, this horrible, brutal, genocidal racism that took place in this country, which we were not told about in school. And the other thing, the other revelation for me is that, remember, we had slavery. We had slavery, you know, in the 18th century, certainly uh, most of the 19th century, and we had, you know, black racism throughout. 
And what's interesting is you find examples of the Indians being treated as slaves, just as if they were black. But in some places, the Indians owned slaves, just as if they were white. Slavery, you know, <clears throat> permeated the whole social experience in the U.S., and the Indians were really close to that on both sides of the line. The worst side, of course, was the side where they were treated as slaves and treated as blacks. And uh, I, I didn't know, and I met somebody not too many years ago, uh, which was uh, a revelation for me also, is that in one of the reservations in the United States, um, there was a fair number of black Indians. I had never met a black Indian. But the fact is that there were black Indians 100 years ago, 150 years ago, living on the reservations that the federal government established. And they, <clears throat> they were part of that culture. And so you, you look around and you say, my goodness gracious, they didn't tell us about this school. They didn't tell us about the relationship of the Indians and the blacks and slavery. Um, we really have to learn more about this country. I agree with you that there are some people who have somehow elevated to public office, and, you know, the, uh, the governor of a province and of a state, members of Congress and the like, but as a tiny minority. And they do not do well in business for a variety of reasons, including availability of capital and cultural points that come down through the generations. But, but in fact, um, they're not doing that well. And if you go on the reservations, you find two things. You find poverty, you find abuse, and that includes uh, abuse with alcohol, abuse with drugs, and just as you say, abuse of women as a cultural point. And so um, they are resentful, and they carry a certain animosity toward the white Christian crowd that, that was, you know, in the government, in the many administrations that made waste of them. They broke all those hundreds and hundreds of treaties regularly and had massacres of them. So we look at the movies and we think, oh, the Indians were mean. No, <laughs> the Indians were innocent. Um, it was it was the American people, the American government, who were mean and awful, and in some ways who still are when it comes to Indians. I remember uh, some sort of protest at the beginning of the Trump administration where he dumped on Indian tribes, and they came to Washington to complain about it. But it, by and large, the Indians have not been successful in court to establish themselves. You know, it was not until the Civil Rights Act of, what, 1968, uh, that they were fully, um, you know, franchised, uh, voting and as, as uh, citizens. Up till then, it was kind of spotty, and there were efforts at legislation, but it wasn't complete until the 1960s. <clears throat> and so, you know, you find this lingering thread in the American story uh, that is really hard, hard to accept hard to understand, and hopefully that will change. But still, I don't think we understand it. I don't think we accept it. I don't think we are educated and informed about it. And that is a burden on the country going forward. Furthermore, one other thing. I think the racism that we have against African Americans, other groups in this country, is connected to the racism we have had especially in the 19th century, against the Indians, all those tribes, all those people who were brutalized in the Trail of Tears, um, those, those, those experiences made them harder, more resentful, and it made mm, the guys in the Confederacy who owned slaves, it made them worse. And so there's a connection. I'm not sure what it is. I haven't figured it out. But I'm sure that people have written about this. And not, the books aren't particularly popular because nobody reads them. But, but I think there's a connection between the racism that we practiced and learned and how it informed our way of dealing with the African Americans in and after slavery. It's, as I said at the outset, this whole issue with Indian rights is inextricably intertwined. And they have not had the standing or the rights or the franchise they should have had, even at the time of the Constitution. Well, I think, though, there's, you know, some 
good news in Canada with regard to the native population. And, and really, um, to me, it comes down to an economics concept. You know, that one of the, you know, famous uh, economists uh, in history, you know, basically said that the key to, to improving the lot of, of people comes down to trade and jobs and economics. And, you know, in Canada, you know, similar to your example of the Oklahoma natives just happen to be on good oil land. Um, well, in Canada, the an Indian Act does not allow the natives to sell land uh, to, you know, anybody else. They can rent it or lease it. But, uh, you know, if they're leasing it to anybody other than one of their own tribe members, uh, you know, they've got to deal with the federal government's Indian Act and, and regulations. So it's really hard. Well, that, re that reflects the involved. concern. That reflects the concern of the government that they would be cheated out of their land. Exactly. That's the, what it's all about. Exactly the movie example. <laughs> but, you know, in... Um, you know, the Okanagan Valley where I live, um, you know, we have an extremely prosperous uh, band and they don't sit on any oil. They happen to sit in a, you know, fantastic resort area while really this whole valley is, is a, uh, you know, a resort area to a great extent. And this particular um, uh, First Nation, you know, which is, you know, part of the one like the where I said there's five um, five different First Nations make up the Okanagan Indian Band, uh, but uh, this is one of the f one of the five that's in Canada. Well, they own uh, a uh, fancy resort. They own a huge um, uh, tourist area where they you know show off all kinds of uh, you know native things and you know, history of this and that, but they own a golf course, they own a winery, you know, they own uh, major um, uh, orchards, they own wineries, uh, or let's call it the uh, grape growing as well as the uh, the actual conversion into wine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, And they have no unemployment in that band or that First Nation. No, it's small. It's like, you know, a thousand people are the band members, you know, but uh, but their standard of living is uh, right up to snuff with the uh, the average of the area they live in, where in, uh, you know, the rest of Canada or the Canadian average is the standard of living of the average native in Canada is still uh, between 75 and 80 percent of the local population near where they live, uh, or the non-native. Yeah, I, I understand in the U.S. Uh, some 70% of the identifiable Indians live in cities now, and uh, they have jobs, and they're, you know, assimilated, okay? Uh, maybe not to the extent that um, the founding fathers would have anticipated, but or should have anticipated, but they're in the cities. The concern is not necessarily for them although they may not have the same opportunities that a white Christian would have. Um, the concern is for the ones left behind on the reservations where there is, you know, ubiquitous poverty on these reservations. And the government really hasn't helped. It doesn't spend a lot of money, neither on the state or the federal level. Uh, but as you say, there are um, bright spots in certain areas, for certain groups, certain tribes, uh, which take advantage of their territory uh, and their ex their federal status, because the states, generally speaking, don't run them. The federal government does. They respond to federal law, not necessarily state law. And so what you have is is two hundred and fifty plus. Uh, casinos around the country that are not subject to state regulation, but everybody goes there and they gamble. And I'm not saying it's beautiful like some of the casinos in in Las Vegas, but um, 
They make money in areas where gambling would not otherwise, otherwise be permitted, see. Um, and that is great revenue. There's one in Connecticut that's notable on the East Coast. And as you say, there are some on the West Coast, not too far from the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico, which has a lot of Indians, Pueblo Indians. Um, they have a huge casino there. So these, these areas, um, these opportunities work well, but I'm not sure how many Indians they really serve. I'm not sure how the tribal governance works. Uh, that is, whether the whole tribe has a benefit or just a few people have the benefit. Um, and, you know, nobody has real control over that, not the state or the federal, as far as I can see. So that if a, a couple of guys are lining their pockets out of the revenues out of these casinos, um, what about, you know, the fellows back on the reservations who don't necessarily share in that? So I think it's an inequity. Uh, and th there are people, what, left behind, people living in poverty. Uh, and I'm not sure that the federal government is really taking care of them. The other, you know, interesting point, and, and it, it's relevant to this whole notion about the government stepping in once in a while and feeling sympathy for the Indians and saying, we're not going to let you sell your land, you know, your point, we're not going to sell you, let you sell your land because you'll be cheated. Well, that was, that was generated out of the fact that thousands of Indians were cheated. <laughs> that's why those statutes were passed. That's, that's why it was included in treaties that got broken. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's important to examine the network of laws, the patchwork of laws uh, in the federal government with these treaties, with these tribes, with these locations, with these entrepreneurial activities, and see that it is a complete chaos. It is fragmentation around the country. You really have to be an expert. That's why I said to you at the beginning of this, it's a deep and complex subject because it differs. There's so many different scenarios and situations and laws and inconsistencies, even from the United States Supreme Court. And so it's, it's hard to say that we have done a good job in governing the welfare of our indigenous native people. Well, <clears throat> we have not done much better in the past, but I think uh, Canada is certainly standing on its head now uh, to do better. Um, you know, and the province that I live in is kind of unique physically. It's it's kind of like, you know, Switzerland, where there's um, there's there's no flat land. <laughs> You're either in a in a skinny valley, uh, which usually has a lake and a river in it. Or, or you're on a mountain that uh, that's steep enough that it uh, you, you can't grow anything on it. You can't do anything. And uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that uh, from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean in Canada is very different from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean in in Washington State or Oregon uh, because the there's a series of mountain ranges in in say Washington state and Oregon there there is a coast range but it's not like the coast range as you go north you know if you look, see any of these Alaska cruises you know you have the icebergs dropping from a mountain right into the ocean you know that is there is no land between the coast range and the water and that applies for most of British Columbia. You know, this is the only place where there's, you know, lots of of um, land, you know, is uh, where, you know, there's um, at the south end where the Alaska Panhandle ends, you know, is right in that area. There's a, a fair stretch and, and then near Vancouver. And the rest is, you know, the mountains are, pretty close to the to the ocean. Well, between the Rocky Mountains and that coast range, there are several north-south running additional mountain ranges. So that, you know, there's nothing but these skinny valleys. So when so when the uh, North American continent was um, was settled, it was very hard to get to British Columbia. You know, that that you got 
to the Rocky Mountains, and then everybody just stopped. You know, where you'd have these things of, of you know, the Lewis and Clark uh, type of thing. They had some difficulty making it from, you know, Montana to, to Oregon, you know, but if they were another 150 miles north, they'd have never made it. <laughs> you know, you just, you know, there's, there's about three extra mountain ranges in between. And, uh, and so our native problem developed very differently from the rest of Canada. Uh, and that <clears throat> what you had was all, we had a large native population that was integrated economically fairly well until there was a gold rush. You know, that is immediately following the California gold rush was a gold rush in British Columbia, and then that was followed by the one in the Yukon and Alaska. Well, uh, Did you know, just, by the way, that there was a gold rush in Georgia in the 1830s? I bet you didn't know that. No, I did not know that. How about, but then, how of course, about that? <laughs> but then, of course, I... I the only education I got in the United States was a university. <laughs> um, and in Canada, we didn't even learn about the natives. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> however, the uh, British Columbia scenario was very different that, that as, as um, the, before the Oregon Treaty was signed, uh, you know, the, it was like the United Kingdom dealing in British Columbia. Canada was something, Ontario, Quebec, you know, Eastern stuff, you know, and, and you know, the Western part of the U.S. You had Mexico owning, you know, California and, and Nevada and Arizona type of thing. And, and immediately north of that was this, you know, funny Oregon territory or whatever you wanted to call it. And, and, Years before, the border between Canada and the U.S. was settled from the Great Lakes to the Rocky Mountains, you know, on the 49th parallel. But there was no border between what's now British Columbia and Washington and all the way down to Mexico. It was, who's the United States? <laughs> you know, they they kind of were Oregon territory stuff, anything north of what the Mexicans owned, the U.S. was involved, but so was the British. Well, in the, you know, well into the 1800s until the gold rush, you know, the real activity in British Columbia was there was good business occurring in Vancouver, but the biggest business was the fur trade. And the fur trade related to a network of of dealing with all of these Indian tribes that occupied all the valleys in British Columbia, and they, you know, shuffle their their furs to the only two places you could kind of get to the ocean, you know, and uh, <clears throat> and that this fur trade was one where the economies of the natives greatly improved. Uh, you know, it was very different than, you know, the like Montana or Alberta. You know, the treatment of the natives there, you know, was a different scenario altogether. Uh, there was just no connection once the Rocky Mountains just provided a barrier. And, uh, and that, until the um, gold rush, which we kind of inherited, you know, a slug of the gold rush participants came from California. They were Americans that had their, you know, racial bias built in. <laughs> and that, uh, you know, when they were looking for gold, they didn't care what native was in that valley, you know, and, uh, and they created a major mess. But there was enough people that stayed in British Columbia, because it is a very nice place to live, much like Washington State. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the end result was um, what the governor of British Columbia back, you know, in the early days, they decided that, you know, the key to the native situation is, you know, 
those that weren't going to die from the disease, like smallpox, you know, we just kind of squish them out and and confine them to areas and not enter in, into any kind of treaty with any of them. And so British Columbia went for a long time without having treaties of any sort. And so, you know, you're sitting where today it's a day and night scenario difference is, is that, you know, British Columbia is loaded with resources. And of course, most resources you, you deal with in, in the valley. Well, well, the native population in British Columbia has what are called land claims. And the land claims of the native population are between two and three times the area of the whole province. Oh, no, well, how, can you, how can you do that? How can you have oh, claims well, they that claim? Exceed? Well, okay. that was because the Canadian court system and politicians kind of softened up to, gee, we've been miserable people, and that isn't Canadians. We're we're good people. We should be more humane, and and so they built in certain laws, um, and one of them was where where the where there was not a treaty that the native population had certain rights to their original hunting grounds, you know, wherever they dealt. Well, of course, if you're an Indian band and you're in one little skinny valley, you can say, well, we've got that valley. Well, they claimed, well, we went from the mountaintop on one side to the mountaintop on the other side. But then, of course, there was the odd river or pass in between. Well, of course, we were in the other valley as well. <laughs> you know, so so the tribes on both sides would say they all had rights to the central well, valley. You know, we haven't mentioned that, and I think it's really important to punctuate what you're saying. Is is the the Indians were not monolithic? There were hundreds of tribes, or dozens of them anyway, across the U.S., and they were fighting with each other. The Indian wars were happening constantly through the 19th century, and sometimes well, they held each other as slaves. You know, they uh, held each other, others as slaves. If one tribe well, captures others and enslaves, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's been covered in the in the in the popular literature and and filmmaking, um, but but the government was rightfully concerned to stop the Indians from fighting with each other um, because they, they're. Their whole historic experience um, before the white man came was to have these regular wars. Uh, we don't realize that. It wasn't well, most of, the, most of the BC ones did not have wars against each other, much like the ones on the prairies did. Like, you know, uh, I was raised in a city, Calgary, Alberta, and the natives around there fought each other like crazy. <laughs> you know, but not the ones in in British Columbia. And, Interesting. And yeah. So, yeah, and you ended up where these um, uh, British Columbia the courts in Canada have said that the natives had some rights to all of their historical hunting grounds or wherever they you know traveled and dealt. What was their original territory? Well, they got some rights. So what happens if you want to build a pipeline from the you know, oil sands in northern Alberta to the coast in British Columbia, you got to go through, you know, while British Columbia has 300 First Nations, that is, entities where the federal government of Canada has said they can call themselves a First Nation and they're entitled to certain amounts of self-government, you know, so let's say Metro Vancouver has five levels of government. Well, you know, the, the, it seems to me that the, uh, both governments, U.S. and Canada, they have you know provided certain benefits and they've been sympathetic and maybe more or less. But the question is whether they have gone far enough or too far. What do you think about Canada in that regard? Some have gone too far uh, because, um, for example, uh, uh, in northeast British Columbia, which happens to be east of the Rocky Mountains, because the Rocky Mountains run at an angle, uh, and so um, 
that portion of British Columbia is the only portion that isn't solid mountains. Uh, and it has just a ton of oil and gas, probably, you know, the biggest gas field in, in North America um, that's not really producing diddly squat in gas, you know, because you can't move it anywhere. You know, we're selling whatever gas the U.S. will take which the U.S. is then converting into LNG, <laughs> you know, Canadian gas being exported via the U.S. Um, at a markup, you know, but to get across British Columbia with a pipeline is almost impossible because every one of these 300 First Nations, you know, have certain rights to go to court mm -hmm. and argue and say, well, we're not being compensated in G. That's a problem. That's a problem. And you need the federal government to straighten it out because ultimately it's an economic problem. Well, the federal I mean, government caused it. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> but you know, the modern government has to inherit that. So uh, before we close, I, I do want to touch on um, a couple of the tribes that you mentioned uh, in Alaska, you know, American tribes. It's, it's the uh, the uh, Inuit. The Inuit is one, and the Aleuts is the other. From the word Aleutian, you know, Aleutian yeah. chain. They, they came from the Aleutian chain from Asia. Um, but the, you know, they they do pretty well with the cruise ships now, and the cities in Alaska. They have businesses. They conduct tours. They are an inherent part of tourism. Um, and so it works well for them, and uh, you have to give them credit. And you have to give them. You have to give the hospitality industry, the cruise ship industry, credit for that. And you know who visits them? The Native Hawaiians from Hawaii visits them. Well, there's yeah, a I kind of camaraderie. I, I, I think you you might be reading some propaganda because the the natives that are benefiting from the tourist industry are in the Alaska Panhandle you know, where Juneau is, and up to where Anchorage is. But if you go anywhere where there are the Inuit, there is no cruise ship going anywhere near there. That, like, that's the north slope on the Beaufort Sea where they have all the disputes of, you know, the Caribou Range and they shouldn't have oil up there. You know, like that that dispute. But there, those Inuit are just sucking air the same as the ones in northern Canada. You know, the yeah. climate change is ruining their the foundation upon which their buildings exist. It's ruining their hunting. Uh, you know, at least the caribou herds are still in fairly good form. Let me let me turn to Hawaii before we close, and that is Hawaii Hawaii is indigenous people, of course, native Hawaiians. Um, it's easier to track when they came here because it wasn't that long ago, um, as opposed to American Indians and Canadian in Indians and Indians in Latin America, for that matter, because that was way, way back when. Um, but in, in Hawaii, it's not the same. People, some people like to treat Native Hawaiians as indigenous people, Indian people, but they're not really grouped with Indian people. As far as the reading that I could, I have done, uh, they're a special category, and they have different issues and you know different mm, expectations and different treatment by the government, and their their level of assimilation into the society is different. Um, but I think that's worth mentioning because um, the, the the origin and the process runs a parallel to what you've been talking about and what I've been talking about. Well, uh, having visited Hawaii many times, you know, I felt that the the bigotry against Native Hawaiians was not much different than the bigotry against anybody else is different than the guy who has the bigotry. That is, bigotry seems to be a built-in human trait, and and so any society tends to sort of categorize people you know if you if you you know live in a, a place where there's multi-racial people there tends to be in everybody's mind a ranking of who's the 
you know, the least miserable or who's the best and who's the worst. That's yeah, so true. It's all around the world in, in the audible ranking. And uh, it's a, a troublesome aspect of, of the human condition. Ken, we're out of time. Uh, Ken Rogers, a retired Canadian businessman from Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, helping us understand not only what happens in Canada, but how that's different from what happens in the U.S. Thank you so did much. You, did you know Kelowna was an Indian word? <laughs> I did know that. I did know that. And everybody listening should make a note that Kelowna is an Indian word. As a matter of fact, if you look across Canada and if you look across the United States, you will find a tremendous number of place names are Indian words. And on that note, we have to go. Thank you, Ken. Aloha. this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much.